So we all need a, uh, a good laugh once in a while. And uh, today we have a, a great guest who will actually get us laughing. Um, and his name is Steve Rizzo. He used to be a stand-up comedian uh, turned professional motivational speaker. So let's get into the show. And so, obviously, uh, before we do that, I want to just play you a quick uh, piece on introducing Steve and how he became and developed his own humor being. What if you had a special quality within you that could take you from a bad mood to a good mood in a matter of seconds? What if you had a special friend that you could always depend on to help you through the tough times? What if you had a special power within you that could actually create miraculous happenings in your life? Well, I'm here to tell you today that you do have that special quality, you do have that special friend, and we all have that special power. It's called your humor being. <laughs> that was fantastic. I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> making you cry all over. Yeah. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago. Um, it was an amazing stage. It looks like you were playing a uh, a theater venue. It wasn't like like a, like a a conference hall. It was more like a uh, like a hotel or like you normally would do as a stand up comedian. Actually, it uh, it was a theater. It was in uh, South Ta uh, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, and uh, it was a great audience. And uh, I had a blast doing it. I, I didn't even I don't even know where they found. They just called me and said we'd like you to do a TED talk. And I said okay. I flew down. They had some wonderful, wonderful speakers. Everyone spoke on various topics, and uh, I really nailed it with the humor being thing, and um, it went very well. Yeah, it looks like you had some of your best material in there too. So if you you haven't uh, seen it, we'll put the uh, the link in the show notes so you can watch it after you finish watching this. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. So, who are you? What do you do? And uh, why are you on the show today? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've done the research on, on you at all. <laughs> nice talking to you. I got to go now. <laughs> so, yeah. So um, how did you, you became a, a comedian, stand-up comedian first? What was the inspiration there? Ah, geez. You know, um, I was teaching uh, at a high school on Long Island. And uh, in between sets, uh, in, in between uh, um, after school, I would um, perform at night. I played the guitar with a friend of mine and we started getting very well known. And I started performing in all the clubs in Long Island, New York City, Connecticut, New Jersey. And we had quite a following. Uh, you know, I get home sometimes at three in the morning, then wake up at five to go to school to teach. But I did that for a couple of years. But in between sets, in my music sets, I, uh, I did a lot of funny stuff real funny stuff. And I was really drawing in audiences and, and really pulling in crowds at a lot of the clubs I was performing in. And I would, I had a guitar, so I did impressions. I would do Bob Dylan singing Elvis Presley songs. And I would do all these impressions. And before you know it, people at comedy clubs heard about me. Owners would ask me to do stand up at their clubs. And I would go, no, no, no way. There's no way I'm doing stand up. Well, to make a long story short, uh, um, my friend and I stopped doing that. And um, one day I was walking in the city and I was walking by Catch a Rising Star. And uh, they had audition night that particular night. It was a Saturday. And uh, I decided to uh, walk in and try. I did it. And I swear to you, this very rarely happens to people who are starting out. I got a standing ovation. I did seven minutes. It's all I was allowed. I got a standing ovation. And I was hooked. And I just said, that's what I'm doing. So I... Um, I started performing at all the clubs on Long Island because clubs started opening up in the early 80s all over the place. And um, uh, at night, I would do stand-up. And during the day, I taught. And finally, I was getting real good. And people were asking me to perform in different parts of the country. And I quit teaching. And I did it full-time. And it was a trip. It was everywhere. Colleges headlined immediately. Colleges, clubs, theaters. And uh, at that time in the 80s, every, every state, every city in every state had a comedy club. 
Omaha, Nebraska had three comedy clubs. Des Moines, Iowa had two comedy clubs. It, it was just, it was crazy. It was a, it was a, a, a rampage of laughter throughout the country. And that lasted for 10 years. And also what you do with stand up as opposed to ensemble. Excuse me? You did mostly stand up as a, a one. Oh, well, yeah. I, 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 yeah, just straight stand up. And I, 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 maybe I halfway through my act, I would pick my guitar up and then give them a different flavor of different different stuff. And that's when it was a little bit of audience participation. And to be honest, and I'm not bragging, anyone that had a that followed me had a hard time doing it because I got the audience going crazy. You know, with the feedback, it's very difficult to follow someone who has that much energy. You know what I mean? Because most comedians, it's it's set up punchline, set up punchline. But mine was just, it was crazy. It was pandemonium sometimes because I would get them involved. Yeah. So uh, it, it, was, it was it was a blast. It was a blast. So your, your style is mostly storytelling, and, and that's what you're kind of working on these days? Well, well actually, yeah, right now uh, as a speaker. And, and that's something happened in the, in the midst of my, uh, my, my stand-up career. Um, I started getting this calling to wanting to do something else because I realized every time I was on stage, that teacher part of me was always there. And although, although I was really fulfilled at making people laugh because I knew people needed to laugh, um, mm-hmm. I, I just felt there was something something else missing. And I was always aware on that stage that uh, when I was making them laugh, that there were people in the audience experiencing major challenges of some kind, you know, maybe they were going through a divorce, having financial difficulties, maybe they or a loved one were inflicted with some kind of illness. But for those few hours at the comedy club, their challenges and problems didn't own them, because they were simply allowing themselves to take time out to laugh. And, and as I always say, you know, and I say it in my programs, laughter is the pit stop in the rat race of life and that it gives you enough emotional fuel and repairs to get back into the race again. But the initiative and the proficiency by which you allow yourself to laugh comes from what I call your humor being. And that's when I coined that phrase, humor being. So then I just started doing a lot of, a lot of studying on, on the healing powers of humor, the spiritual aspects of humor. And then I wrote a book, Becoming a Humor Being. And then I started going on a self-help quest. And I started listening to all these CDs and going to sleep with headphones with positive affirmations. I went to spiritual retreats and listen. I went to I don't know how many Tony Robbins seminars. And it was at a Tony Robbins seminar where I'm watching this guy. And I, I didn't even I wasn't even aware I was doing this. He's on stage. And there's like thousands of people and he's got them in the palm of his hands. And he was pretty funny, too. He was very entertaining. And I was very aware of that. And something made me pick up my pen and write down. I can do this. That's what I wrote. Not even aware I was writing it. And I put the pen down and I guess maybe another 15 minutes went by and I wrote down, I should do this. And then I put the pen down. And then all of a sudden, another maybe 10 or 15 minutes went by and I picked it up again and I wrote, I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. I still have that paper in framed in a glass um, uh, in my in my office. It's in a frame. And I did it. I did it. And that was at the pinnacle of my comedy career. It, it, I mean, it wasn't overnight. I mean, that it, it just stuck with me. I told my manager, it was about a couple of years later when I was on this self, self-help quest, um, that I had to do this. I couldn't wait anymore. And this is when the industry was very interested in me, but I was no longer interested in them. So I, um, I remember my roommate was Drew Carey, and uh, I was talking to him about switching careers, and he was dead against it. He said, you can't, you can't. And that one night when I came home from an audition, he said, how did your audition go? I said, it was great. And he goes, well, what do you want to do for dinner? I said, uh, you do what you want. I'm packing my stuff up. I'm moving back to Long Island, and I'm getting into the speaking business. We had a big argument. And he said something to me, which I'll never forget. You can't leave now. You're so close to making it. I said, if I don't want it anymore, I'm not close to making anything. I'm moving further away from what I really want to do. And I know in a way it didn't make sense to me, but you always have to follow your heart. And it was frightening to do that because I dedicated 20 years of my life as a comedian. And there I am making the shift and it was the best move I ever made. But you never really gave up that, that comedian portion because 
when you're doing your motivational speakers uh, speaking, you, you include a lot of humor in there. And I think that's an essential, even with those who people who are serious, like a Tony Robbins, who's up there talking, unless you have some sort of humor in there, it's basically what facts and yeah. maybe some inspiration, but, yeah. uh, but I think it's humor that really uh, engrosses and, and really connects with your audience. Uh, especially, that's a great point, uh, I, I, especially today where the attention span of the average audience is very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. And unless a speaker has some kind of ent entertaining value, you run the risk of losing the, their attention. And uh, I've always realized that it's that humor because it's there uh, during my speeches. So I'm giving right. this really profound message, but they're enjoying themselves. And, and I always hear compliments like, uh, gee, never have I uh, uh, laughed so hard and learned so much in one sitting, man. Thanks for the ride. And that's what, that's, that's what works. There's a big psychology involved there. And uh, I, as I say, when people ask me, how do you make it work like that? I say, well, I engage the audience with laughter and, and they don't realize what I'm doing. They don't know I'm manipulating them. You know, because uh, I want them to like me. And and when you make people laugh, they instantly like you. So my yeah. first five minutes before I even say anything profound or message, I'm making them laugh. And as I'm doing that, they're trusting me. You can see them. Actually, you can feel the energy. And then I start hitting them with the message. And then it's more laughter. Then it's message with the laughter. Before you know it, it's over. And they're going, wow, that was a trip. I had a blast and I learned so much. And you know what's real funny too, Bruce, is that they didn't realize the message until weeks later or even more when they just go, wow, his strategies really work. I was able to handle this situation from what he said because they're remembering what a great time they have, but they don't even know why until these strategies that I offer, are uh, they're implementing them. And, and that's the greatest compliment I can get. I get emails all the time. And I'm not saying this to impress anyone just to impress upon them that I, 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 this is what I do. This is, this is my essence of who I am. I'm funny. And, but my main goal, my mission is to get the word out to people that uh, they are more powerful than they possibly imagined. All they have to do is learn how to get out of their way. Right. And they can, they can be whatever they want to be. And a lot of times and what you usually talk about on stage is, getting over that uh the, that doldrum that uh, the inner thought of i cannot do this and how humor even a simple laugh uh sometimes even a first laugh can help you overcome obstacles oh absolutely and 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 and, and the more they get in tune with their humor being uh the easier life becomes um humor nips negative thought patterns in the bud before emotional havoc blossoms. You could prove this to yourself at any given time, at any time. As a, as a matter of fact, I remember there was an incident, I don't know where this came from, but there was an incident uh, during 9-11. It was about a week after, and um, I was watching the news and these firemen, volunteers, police officers are going into the rubble and they're looking for bodies still looking for survivors and um there's this one fireman with, with, with a typical new york attitude he's standing there he's taking a break his arm is in a sling he's got a bandage around the head we could see the big blood stain on the bandage he's filthy with soot and he's about to go in there and there's people all around him and the reporter goes how is it that you are able to have the courage to go in there when you could hardly move your arm and you're bandaged all up and you look like you're near exhaustion. What's giving you the energy to do that? And he grabs her microphone and goes, hey lady, two things. I'm a fireman and I'm from New York. That's all you need to know. And everyone started laughing. I swear, Bruce, everyone in that solemn moment, I grant you that laughter only lasted a couple of seconds, but sometimes a couple of seconds is all you need to catch your second wind. And laughter gives you that couple of seconds again, over and over again. And the more you use your sense of humor, especially during tough times, the easier life becomes. And what a wonderful gift to give to your children. 
especially during this pandemic, when parents are with their kids 24 seven, they're not going to work. The kids are home from school. I mean, a lot of people are getting depressed. The suicide rate went up tremendously in this country. But if parents could let children know that sometimes in your life, no matter what happens, life is great and life is beautiful and you're always going to have good times. But you know what? You're going to be confronted with major challenges, sometimes even more than what the normal person will ever have to go through. But, and there's a big but here, there's always room for laughter, always. But most people wait for life to turn around to be good for them in order for them to find the laughter. Uh -uh. I'm saying you've got to be able to laugh during the tough times. And that's the stuff that will help you to bounce back. It's the great bounce back factor. So how do you keep your laughter up? I mean, you're, you're not doing your standups. You're not doing your locations. You're not traveling like we used to. Um, yep. how, how has last year been for you? as a motivational speaker and how are you overcoming that? That's a good question. And I'm not going to answer it. No, I'm going to kidding. Uh, last well, year was very kind of the show. Questions you don't get, you don't stay on the show. So. <laughs> You're right. There you go. Uh, uh, last year was very challenging for everyone in my business, not just me. Uh, and um, I'm used to flying 200,000 miles a year. That was my life. And I love traveling and I couldn't wait to get home. And then when I was home for, I had the best of everything. I, I loved my home and I loved, I loved being on the road and, and everything. It was great. But when that was taken away from me, a part of my life was taken away from me. And for the first four months, I had a difficult time, a very, very difficult time. But because of what I do and because of the strategies that I, I, I always teach to people, uh, I'm walking my talk mouth now than I ever did. And even though it was challenging, I was very aware of what would happen if I opened up the door to the negative zone. And I kept saying, I'm not working now. My life feels like if I would have stuck to that, it would have been very challenging. So I did things that I know would allow me to unleash the power of my humor being. And when you do that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you find something to laugh at but you find something and get involved in something that you thoroughly enjoy. Since that one part was taken away, the traveling, I had, wow, I love my grandchildren. They're only 20 minutes from me. I spent an incredible amount of time with them. And I'll tell you right now, there within lies the laughter, just watching them, just listening to them, having conversations with them. Almost every night, I'll go to my favorite Italian restaurant and I'll sit there because I love the people there. And everyone bonds together. We listen to each other's problems, and there's tons of laughter there. And those are the things that we have to do. I actually, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, uh, wake up every morning, and rather than fixating on what isn't working, uh, focus on what is working. Bless the things that life has given you, rather than cursing what life has currently thrown on you or what life has taken at you. And when you wake up with that mindset, you promise yourself you won't get out of bed or even take the covers off until you create that habit of what you're grateful for. Laughter becomes a lot easier throughout the day. You're able to look at situations that would normally take you off and you step on the other side of the line and you try to find the humor in it. <clears throat> it's like I said, the more you use a humor being, the easier it is. I think a lot of people also keep track of their uh, what they're grateful for like write, writing three things they're grateful for every day. And in the beginning, it's pretty easy. I'm grateful for the sunshine. I'm grateful for the plants. I'm grateful for the flowers. And then after about a week or two weeks, it's like, okay, now you have to actually start looking within yourself to see what you're grateful for. Yeah, but and, and yeah, that's true. And, but what you have to do too, that, that, grat that attitude of gratitude, you just don't do it in the morning. You got to be aware and you have to take it with you throughout the day. And at some point during the day, when you feel that you're in the midst of a major challenge or somebody ticks you off or you're having some kind of a problem with your spouse or, or your worker or just someone on the road ticks you off, um, you have to become aware that you're entering into that negative zone. There is a negative emotion about to consume you, whether it's anger, fear, jealousy, self-doubt, overwhelm. It doesn't matter. It's happening. And soon as you become aware, you say to yourself, well, okay, where is this going to take me? 
all right, that guy just pissed me off big time. I got a meeting and I have to meet with a client. What's going to happen to me if I take that attitude with me to meet that client? Now, that's not going to end up too good. So I have to shift my focus and my way of thinking to become the real me and throw that negative part of myself to the wayside. And every time you do little stuff like this and become aware of, and you go, wow, I feel better already. Say to yourself, this really works. This stuff works. And, and the more you do that, the more that becomes a part of you. My life right now, Bruce, is based on three principles. And when I speak to groups, no matter what presentation that I give them, they're based on these three principles. Number one, you need to know without a doubt that you are the creator of your success and happiness. And what that means is, is that it's not what happens to you that determines how successful or how happy you're going to be. It's what you do about what happens. It's the choices that you make. The second principle is you need to understand that you are the only problem that you will ever have. And somewhere within you, there is always, always a solution waiting to be discovered. You just have to learn how to get out of your way to find that solution, to hear it. The third principle is really important. Whenever you're confronted with a challenge or a problem of any kind, it's never a matter of managing the situation. It's always a matter of how you manage your mind. Can you manage your mind and, and your thoughts and emotions that are keeping you from finding the solution that's waiting to be discovered? So those uh, situations where all the others are losing their heads, but you're keeping your calm, um, you will succeed with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know what, and and what I'm saying too, it it may not it. The chances are it could make your problem go away, but the chances are it won't. But my strategies, what I offer, and these principles, help you to work your way through the problem, and that's why we're here on this planet. How are you going to work through the problem? It's not going to make it go away. We are here in this planet to experience, to learn, to grow, and to become the best person that we can be. And how you experience all the things that happen to you will determine what you learn. That continued learning leads to your growth. That continued growth paves the way to who and what you become. Your job, your responsibility is to become the best person that you can be in any given circumstance. You know, life will always, is always going to throw stuff at you. It's really what you do about how you're going to handle it. Are you going to look at it? as a lesson in life 101, or are you going to look at it like it's the apocalypse? And even for those who are experiencing something that is, is, is relative to the apocalypse, there are still choices involved in that. We have a tendency, it's part of the human condition, to make challenging problems worse than what they have to be because we're wallowing in so much of the problem that we're not giving ourselves any kind of advantage to uh, um, um, find solutions to the problem, things that could ease the pain in, in, in one way or another because we get consumed by the crap. It's part of the human condition. So do you believe in uh, in luck, in lucky situations where if you just believe in it, it will happen, or do you actually have to work at it? I, I believe we make our own luck. And that's what we always see people all the time. That person's lucky. You know, this person, look how successful he is. Well, he's lucky. Look, he keeps making more money. Well, that's because he has that type of mindset. He or she has that type of mindset. We make our own luck. There are no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Even those who had incredible odds thrown against them. I have a brother that's 100% disabled as a result of the Vietnam War. The only man in medical history that ever survived that wound. He's a medical journalist as a miracle, as someone who beat the odds. Now, you would say that everything was thrown against him. Doctors said he wouldn't even live long. He's alive today. They said he wouldn't be able to do this, that, and the other thing. He's one of the most, if not the most successful person that I know because he refused to focus on what was missing. He had the mindset where he said, all right, this is what happened to me. There's nothing I can do to change that. What do I have to do to live the life that I want to live? What do I need to do to go from here to here? What strategies do I have to incorporate to enjoy my life on some level? Who can I go to that can help me? I, 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 this may not be easy, but I, I know I can do this and I'm going to do it, whatever it takes. Was it easy? Nope, but he did it. And he's still doing it. He walks the talk better than anyone I know. And then you have those who have every advantage thrown their way 
every advantage, and yet they somehow managed to sabotage their success. Yep, I think also something you mentioned in there, reaching out to those who could help. Because a lot of times people who think they're in something by themselves, and they try to solve it by themselves. It's like, there's no such thing as a self-made millionaire or self-made success. There's always someone there who's helped them in some way or another. So again, it's reaching out to other people and finding those people who are willing to help. Well, that's, that's right. And that's part of the same mindset as that you create your own luck. Because if you have that mindset, those serendipitous events always come your way. Serendipity comes your way in the form of someone who could help you, you know? If you're asking yourself and you know you can get to where you want to go and you're saying to yourself, okay, what do I need to do to get to this next step? Because I don't know how to do this. What can I do? Who can help me? What, what needs to be done? How can I learn this? And if you ask that question, whether it's in prayer or you say it online or out loud, there is a higher nature of us, a higher part of us that we can communicate with day in and day out 24-7. You just have to stifle the ego, or as I like to call it, the big mouth inside your head from saying to you, this is impossible. You're not going to be able to do this. I'm telling you, this is tough. Remember the last time you tried to do something, it didn't work. Just play it safe and stay where you are at this point. Now, you just know that you're going to find the answer. And that's when serendipity starts working. And you never know where it's going to come from. It can come right. from listening to someone on TV. It can come from a song. It could hit you as you're taking a shower, as you're shaving. Someone could call you. Someone could call you. This happened to me, as a matter of fact, with that video that I showed you, the word according to Bob, that video. Yep. That happened from a guy, and I was saying, how can I create this video? This guy called me that day. Someone I haven't heard from in 35 years who does a lot of TV stuff. He's a director. He's a producer. And he called me, and I said, man, how are you doing? And all of a sudden, it hit me. And I said, whoa, I have an idea. What do you think? And he said, come to the studio. He lived in Jersey. He lives in Jersey. An hour and 20 minutes from where I live. And you saw what I created. It came out great. He's, yep. because I asked, I asked that higher part of me, send that person to me, that thing to me, the book, but whatever it is that I need to, to accomplish this next goal. And he called me that very day. That's a perfect example. And so speaking of this, we're according to Bob. Um, do you want to talk about how you're looking to launch this series or are we still keeping it undercover? No, no, we could talk that. Uh, I'll, I have, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I'll be working with you. And uh, the name of the series is going to be, Hey, I'm Talking Here. That's going to be my uh, live streaming TV show and it's going to be a TV show. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be a half hour, maybe 40 minutes long. And one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, segments in this streaming TV show it's going to be something that I uh, have recorded in the studio from this guy that I told you I met, and it's going to be called The Word According to Bob. It's a two-minute, two-and-a-half-minute piece where uh, Bob, by the way, is, is God, and um, uh, Bob gives you strategies in every one of these segments on how to get through the tough times, how to take control of your life. As Bob always says, you are far more powerful than you could possibly imagine. And that's going to be part of the process. And, and as a matter of fact, Bruce, this is amazing because you came to me in a serendipitous way. You came to me because Kellen Fisher was speaking so highly about you. But I never would have, I never would have been introduced to Kellen Fisher unless my very dear friend, Jeffrey Gittimer, introduced her to me. That's how it works. That's how it works. No coincidences in life. So and now I, you and I are, are, but go ahead. Yeah, and I met her through the same process where COVID hit. Um, and I started saying, well, I need to step up my, my sales game. And so I started following Jeffrey Gittimer, who actually this week will be celebrating one year of consistently going live every single day for an entire yep. year. Yep. That's the blessing in the sky. And so a lot of, I mean, I know things have slowed down, things have shut down, things have actually, horrible things have happened over the past year. But I think also it opened up doors for other things. Uh, you have been doing this, this live stream every, every week for the past year, had it not been for the shutdown. Right. Perfect. Perfect example. And by the way, of opening up doors, uh, the doors don't open. You're really opening the door. 
it's that Bob part of you that is acknowledging what you're saying and the door miraculously opens. There within lies the benefit, the blessing in disguise from this pandemic with me and for you and for most other people who are in that hole. I reinvented myself. I love doing virtual presentations now. I never thought I would love them more than live presentations. And I'm telling you, the biggest benefit with a virtual presentation now is that this is, this is the response that I get from the attendees. Like, wow, I felt as if he were talking directly to me. And I am because these people are in their own space. Yep. They're in their own, they're, they're alone. They're by themselves. They're not surrounded in a convention center, surrounded by hundreds or thousands of people where they are free to express their own emotions in their thought process. They're, they're seeping in the information from a totally different part of themselves. And that's the blessing within disguise in a virtual presentation. Yep. So, and I take advantage of that. And then there's something else you're also uh, exploring is a platform called Clubhouse where you're going weekly and telling very uh, unique stories uh, about your experiences with some really uh, established comedians and uh, celebrities. Oh, that, that's, I'm having a blast with that. And Kellen Fisher uh, introduced me to that too. And you were on some, one of my, one of my talks as a matter of fact, I'm going to be on tomorrow at uh, 12 noon Eastern standard time. And I'm going to be talking the name of it. This particular segment is going to be called believe it and you'll, you'll achieve it. It's my relationship with Eddie Murphy on how everyone says, Oh, he made it cause he was talented and lucky. Uh, uh, he made his own talent because you know, as well as I do that there are, in all walks of life, there are a lot of gifted and talented people who will never attain to the level that they deserve right. within their talent. And that all has to do with the mindset. They don't really believe in themselves. And so, some some actually find happiness after they quit. And I can name two people. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You, and a guy named Rodney. Rodney Dangerfield, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, it's, I knew him personally. And it's funny, he won his whole life. He wasn't as, um, he wasn't the jovial person that most people knew. And I'm not talking about him, this stating a fact. And it's funny that when he retired and finally quit comedy, he found happiness. He led, he ended the last, he spent the last 10 years of his life very happy with this woman who, and they lived happily ever after. But it's amazing when you let go of the thing that's bringing you down, um, because show business can be an incredible amount of pressure. And I don't have time to tell his story now, but maybe some other time we will. And, um, you know, your viewers would get a better perspective on that. But if you could, you can view in uh, tomorrow on, uh, uh, listen in on uh, Clubhouse tomorrow at noon. It should be quite a quite an experience. Excellent. And so to find, find out more about you, we can you can go to this uh, site, which is your, your website, stevezo.com. Yep. Yep. So, if you uh, are you planning on going uh, live and on performances on stage anytime soon? Or are you still sitting? Uh, we're working on this uh, work according to Bob. Oh, well, I'm always going to be working on Bob. Uh, I had quite a few uh, 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 live presentations this year, but they too were canceled because of COVID. Because now some of the companies are having a tough time getting the attendees to sign up because no one feels safe enough yet to sit in, in a convention center right next to people. So um, this thing has taken on its own monstrosity. Uh, and unfortunately, as I stated before, we have made a challenging situation much worse. This is my opinion, much worse than it has to be. Uh, and the media is responsible for that, instilling so much fear in people. Again, I'm not saying it's not serious, but I find it amazing how some states a wide open 15 states are just saying, we're opening up. We're going to be cautious, but we're opening up and other states just won't do it. Uh, other states won't open up for kid, their kids to go to school. I mean, and the suicide rate is, is just going sky high, sky high. The voice rate is sky high. So I'm going to shut up on that because I don't want to get in on, on my political podium. So, so I, I but it was great. A whole new kind of words with that, but you know, it looks like you're running out of time here. We're, we're like four sure. minutes over, but uh, just so for serious, um, follow Steve. He, uh, I'll put again, we'll put the uh, link to his TED talk, which was fabulous. In the also, you, your, even your demo reel is funny. So, if you, if you need a lap a day, you've got content out there. 
um, on your YouTube channel. Again, we'll put the in the show notes. And so I, I, my recommendation is every day, go over to Steve's YouTube channel and watch one of his videos a day. And he's got because you've got a lot of content there. Yeah. And it's all, it's pretty much uh, timeless. It's, it's evergreen content. It's not timely uh, humor and, and inspiration. It's daily humor. And because that's something that's also, uh, who, this, who said, I think it was even Tony Robbins, who said that uh, motivation is a daily process because it's like you take a shower every day and it's, yeah. just not like you, it's not like you take a shower once a week and, and the shower just kind of stays with you. Motivation is a daily process as well. Yes, it is. That's well said. <clears throat> Even though you took it from Tony Robbins, but it was well said. <laughs> no, that's true. And he did say that. And if you think about it, you take a shower every day, but you know, you know, you take another one because you're going to get dirty. Well, negative thoughts are going to be coming through your head every day. So you have to take that emotional, mental, spiritual shower every day and cleanse yourself from that negative stuff. That's your choice and your responsibility. And when you go to my website, folks, please sign up for my Rizzo Gram. It's right on the homepage. It's free. Every week you'll get an article or a video on um, what we're talking about, stuff like this. And it's my way of saying uh, thank you. My goal is to get the message out. And it's such a simple message. And so thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me. You. Uh, I love all your input. And, and I still have uh, eight questions here that I wrote down. We never even got to. So, huh. so we'll have to have, have, have you back. So great. Have a great week. Thanks. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>